of Her Majesty's Government in the name of the Leader of the Opposition, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move the amendment standing in my name and that of my right honourable friends. It seemed to me that we'd heard from the right honourable gentleman his customary speech. It was distinguished by paucity of argument. I noted, I noted a number of the things which he said. He began by some comments about such people as British Telecom and about homeowners and about privatisation. I must say to him that in dealing with privatisation, I would rather listen to the millions of our citizens who bought shares in British yeah, Telecom yeah, than in Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd rather listen to the many employees of the British Freight Corporation who made such a success when that was privatised. And I'd rather listen to the millions of council house owners who, under this government, had an opportunity to purchase their houses which they never would have had under that. He went on at length about my noble friend, my right honourable noble friend, the Earl of Stockton. I remember his policies vividly. He kept public expenditure down, he kept income tax rates world competitive, he turned back the tide of nationalisation, he began the process of leading Britain to Europe and all in the teeth of the then Labour opposition. And in, his, and in his maiden speech in another place, he pointed out that President Mitterrand starting off with Labour policies had had to turn to ours. I noted what the Right Honourable Gentleman said about exchange control. May I point out? May I point out? Of course. Could the, could the Right Honourable Lady explain to the House that if the privatisation giving shares to millions of people has been so successful, why is it that unemployment continues to rise? As the Honourable Member knows, the two are not connected, but I'm amazed that he denies working people shares in their own industry. Yeah. Yeah. Them to have any independence. Yeah. Socialism is not the doctrine of independence, it's the doctrine of dependence of people under the control of socialist government, yeah. and they hate it. The right Honourable Gentleman also spoke about exchange control. May I remind him that even under the most rigid exchange controls, there were currency speculators moving around the world because there's no amount of exchange control which can prevent the enormous billions of currency from moving around the world. And not even he can stop the telephones or the computers yeah. from that rather ridiculous comment that he made. He also spoke, one moment, he also spoke, he also spoke about strikes. May I remind him that when in power, a Labour government complains about strikes. When in opposition, it does its level best to support every one of them. The Right Honourable Gentleman's speech was empty of any serious analysis on recent events or of any convincing alternative policies which his party would pursue. I shall deal with both analysis and policies. But first, I would like to spend one moment on looking at the Labour Party's credentials for bringing this motion before the House. Of course they won't want me to. It exposes just exactly what happened when they put their policies into practice. Their first act, their first act on taking up office in 1974 was to introduce the same quack remedies they then introduced the same quack remedies which they advocate today. In their first year, they increased public spending by £15 billion in today's money. By August 1975, inflation reached the record level of 26.9%. Record inflation, the record held by the Socialist Government. And did that extra expenditure and extra inflation cause unemployment to fall? Of course not. 
One year later, they had more than doubled the unemployment level they'd inherited. Yeah. And what they have to prove now is why when those policies had that effect then, they would not have a similar effect if they were put into execution today. Yeah. By the autumn of 90... By the, yes, when I have finished this particular point, as the Honourable Gentleman knows I customarily do, by the autumn of 1976, Labour's credit was exhausted, no one would lend them money, and they had to go to the IMF for help. That was their policy and practice. Record inflation and it doubled unemployment. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. The Prime Minister must know that as compared with the major other six industrial nations of the world, our unemployment under the last Labour government was the average yeah. of those seven, yeah, and yeah. our inflation was all, also the average. Yes. The Prime Minister must also yes. know yes. that is the reality, yes. both in 74 yes. and in 79. Yes. That is the fact the Prime Minister knows yes. that. She must also know that her inflation rate today is still only the average of the OECD seven, but the unemployment rate is the worst of any of those countries. Yeah. Yeah. What explains that difference? Yeah. 27% was never the average of European inflation. That was the socialist record. That was the socialist record. He mentions, he mentions unemployment. May I point out today that yes, unemployment has again doubled in Britain. May I also point out that according to the European Commission, I do not use my own figures, in unemployment has also doubled in Europe. If people, are, if people request me to answer their questions, I shall of course answer them. If I'm to give way, there's no point unless I answer the questions. The Honourable Gentleman can't stand the answers. That's his trouble because they're right. <laughs> what happened? What happened when the Labour policy, when the Labour government followed that policy, after they'd gone to the IMF, the next year they had to cut their spending by £10 billion in today's money, the biggest single cuts ever known. And those are the credentials of the party which now brings this censure motion on our economic management. Mr Speaker, the House deserves a more serious analysis of the causes of recent increases in interest rates than it received from the Right Honourable Gentleman. And let me say at the outset, it's no use the Right Honourable Gentleman deriding the operation of the markets. The markets are part of the world we live in and he cannot escape their operation any more than his socialist predecessors could. As a major trading nation, it would be disastrous for this country of all countries to turn its back on the markets of the world. The Right Honourable Gentleman scarcely mentioned the real reasons for the recent speculation against the pound and upward pressure on interest rates. Incidentally, he urged us to bring back the MLR. I thought part of his complaint earlier in the week had been that we actually used the MLR. Yeah, yeah. It, clearly did not, it clearly did not suit the Right Honourable Gentleman's purpose uh, to look at the real reasons for recent speculation, but none of them substantiate either his speech or his motion. I think there have been three reasons for the recent speculation against the pound and the upward pressure on interest rates. First, the dollar has been very strong against every other major currency. Since May 1979, the dollar has risen against the Swiss franc by 36%, the Deutsche Mark by 40%, the French franc and the Italian lira by 55%, and sterling by 46%. The process cannot go on indefinitely. It's distorting the pattern of world trade, making it more difficult for debtor countries to service their loans, and it's rekindling protectionist pressure in the United States. It's perhaps for those reasons that the G5 countries in Washington reaffirmed their commitment made at Williamsburg to undertake coordinated intervention as necessary. And that agreement, Mr. Speaker, has already helped to check the rise of the dollar against the rest of the world. And it's very largely the initiative of my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah. Now, the second reason has been uncertainty over oil prices, and particularly the Geneva meeting of OPEC. I give way to the honourable gentleman. Dennis Skinner. Yeah. Is the Prime Minister aware that there's one central weakness in our arguments about the pound being affected by the dollar domination and oil? And uh, during the course of the previous governments, namely Mike Millen's and uh, predecessor, during the course of the Labour governments, 
At all times, the Italian lira traded at a discount against the pound. For the first time since the end of the war, ever since she's been in politics, or most people in this room, the Italian lira this week was trading at a premium against the pound. It's like the man on the Clapham omnibus said to me this morning, what a load of wallies. <laughs> I rather think the expression, what a load of wallop, would in fact just about describe the Honourable Gentleman's intervention, intervening about the strength of the dollar. What he said does not accord with the facts which were in my speech about the strength of the dollar. When I gave the, when I gave the way in which uh, the, uh, dollar, when I, the dollar has risen against the Italian lira by 55% and sterling by 46%. Now, the second reason has been uncertainty over oil prices, and particularly the Geneva meeting of OPEC, and that was certainly a major factor affecting sterling in the last week or two. It was hardly a rational one, because oil represents only 5% of our GDP, and the effect of a $1 fall in the oil price would in itself reduce government revenue by less than half of 1%. So oil remains a major asset to the British economy. And if we were, in fact, to take powers or to exercise powers on depletion of oil in the North Sea, and the Right Honourable General will remember the Varley assurances that we would not do so, to be followed by assurances from this side when we came in government that we would not do so, the effect would be he would not, in fact, get the investment in the North Sea or the exploration in the North Sea, which is so vital for jobs in that particular part of Scotland. I'm interested that he would take, if he would take the powers, he would, of course, put down the possibility of more jobs in that part of Scotland. That would be the result of his policy. Uh, the third factor, which has affected the recent fall of sterling, was a fear that the government was weakening in its resolve on inflation and sound finance. Now, this was a fear which, however unreasonable, could not be dispelled by words of reassurance alone. If my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, had resisted the upward movement in market interest rates, that would have given a totally wrong signal to the markets and would indeed have led them to believe that their fears were justified. But perhaps let the right honourable gentleman tell us, because he has made criticisms, what would he have done? But he specifically refused to. He thinks that he... When oppositions criticise, they're supposed to put forward an alternative. He hasn't got one. It's a as he has, it's a far as he far as he has, insofar as we can deduce it from previous policies, it would do everything possible to damage confidence in the entire future, uh, future uh, direction of this country. His right honourable friend, the member for Sparkbrook, he said recently, uh, had comments about the uh, sterling exchange rate. I gathered he did not say that it thought it was right, but he thought that it may have been right. May have been right. But well, one thing is clear, if an element in the speculation against sterling has been market fears about the government's resolve to contain inflation, the opposition has no remedy whatever to offer. Their policies would make the prospects for inflation infinitely worse. Of course we don't wish to see interest rates high, even for a short period of time. But if they are necessary to protect the long-term strategy, then we shall not hesitate. These high interest rates emphasize just how important it is to exercise the tightest control on government spending and borrowing. Had we not done so, the, the interest rates would have had to have been even higher. What the Right Honourable Gentleman is complaining about is that the government have had the guts to take the measures necessary to maintain our strategy. And the response of the markets has indicated that. And the opposition, by contrast, has lost no opportunity to talk inflation up. Does the Right Honourable Member, the gentleman for Sparkbrook, recall saying during the last election, and I quote him, despite all claims that inflation has been conquered, there is no doubt, he said, no doubt, that inflation will be in double figures by the end of the year if this government remains in office. That's what he said during the last election in May 1983. In December 1983, inflation was 5.3 per cent. The Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Plymouth Devonport, is no doubt similarly disgruntled. Does he recall that he predicted that on the 24th of July last year, that inflation would be 7.5% by the end of 1984. 
the outcome, of course, was 4.6 per cent. This government believes a prosperous and competitive economy requires both a clear financial framework and a government with the resolve to stick to it. Now, for many years, the financial... Yes, I will indeed. I'll give away to the gentleman at the back, because I think he rose before. Chris, would the Right Honourable Lady like to tell the House how many times over the last four years she and her ministers have predicted that unemployment would start coming down immediately? Mr Speaker, I do not think the Honourable Gentleman can find one prediction from me. prediction from me about unemployment. I challenge him to find one from me. He will not be able to do so because for years when I stood at that dispatch box I watched people in the Labour government then refusing to predict and I thought how wise. So don't blame me for being wise. Financial discipline, for many years the financial discipline required for a stable economy came from the system of fixed exchange rate under the Bretton Woods Agreement. But rising inflation throughout the world brought about the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. Today it's recognised not only in Britain but throughout the industrial world that the only foundation is the discipline which a government imposes upon itself and less like Labour, it is to yield its very sovereignty to international bailiffs. It's been suggested many times that Britain should join the exchange rate mechanism of the EMS. Now, we said on many occasions that we're ready to join when the circumstances are right, and I said it again this afternoon. And, of course, the position is reviewed regularly. But I should make clear that joining the EMS is not a way of avoiding rising interest rates. It's a mechanism which yields benefits only if the government is ready to accept the financial discipline it entails, including a rise in interest rates if necessary to maintain the agreed parity, including if necessary reductions in public expenditure and all of the other things which discipline involves and which other countries have had to agree to. It is not a way of escaping discipline or rises in interest rates. It is a way of saying that if certain relationships obtain, then one must in fact put uh, into effect uh, rises in interest rates or changes, uh, or changes uh, in public expenditure. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm grateful to the Prime Minister and no one is arguing with the thesis she's put forward. What we are arguing is that she has given sovereignty on the exchange rate because there is no exchange rate policy to the markets, to OPEC in Geneva and to the next crisis that comes along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do not know how the honourable gentleman would stop large sums of money b uh, moving around the world. He cannot do so. It is absolutely a ridiculous argument. Labour, any government, any government cannot stop the large amounts, the large amounts of money moving around the world. And when you had fixed exchange rates, then you had to change the exchange rates in very sharp steps. And of course, even in the AMS, there are times when you have to have a realignment. Indeed, Socialist France has already had them. So, may I? No, no, no. I will gladly give way, and I enjoy it, as the Right Honourable Gentleman knows. I only give notice that my speech is going to take a bit longer if I do, because there are certain things that I wish to say. So, on that, on that understanding, of course, I'll go. Anybody in this country is pleased that inflation has to kept uh, to the low levels that the Prime Minister has mentioned. But would she not admit that if the exchange rate had not oscillated up to 240 during her period of office and down to 110, we would see now many more people in employment? And one of the arguments for exchange rate stability and entering the ERM of the EMS is that it will allow us to have higher levels of stable unemployment. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Mr. Speaker, oh, Mr. Speaker.
Speaker. The EMS has nothing to do with the dollar rate, as the right honourable gentleman knows. And when the dollar was let, as the right honourable gentleman ought to know. And when, and when the dollar was very weak, he said that deprived us of jobs because we got a lot of American imports. If he takes the reverse of that argument, when the dollar is strong, we should have the opportunity of jobs from getting a lot of exports. But he seems to be wrong all along the line. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this government has set its own disciplines, but that's the only basis for the creation of wealth, prosperity and jobs. But although governments, and I want to make this very clear on employment, although governments can create the financial framework, they alone cannot create jobs. Jobs come when enterprise has the freedom and vigour to meet the demands of the market, to produce the goods and services people want and are prepared to pay for. The right honourable gentleman doesn't like that. May I, may I read what they said when they were in government? Because they said almost the same thing. The only answer to the economic problems which have dogged Britain ever since the war is to improve the performance of our manufacturing industry. That means higher productivity, better design, more vigorous salesmanship, more reliable delivery and servicing, and that means good management and good relations and cooperation with trade unions and management and fewer strikes and better delivery dates. That was, of course, what the then Chancellor said when he was in power. We have to compete in the markets of the world, not on the basis of national self-esteem, but in the eyes of people making hard-headed decisions about the design and the value of the products we offer. The problems of the economy lie not in insufficient demand, for every category of spending is at record levels. Nor is it a lack of public spending, which is now takes 10% more of GDP than it did 20 years ago when unemployment was a fraction of what it is now. Nor is it a neglect of the infrastructure, since spending on major roads has increased by 25% in real terms under this government, investment in water is increasing by 9% next year. Infrastructure investment must, however, like all other investment, be justified by its return. It's not a cheap route to more jobs. Those who genuinely want more jobs must address the deep-seated problems of the economy, such as the amount we pay ourselves in relation to the amount we produce. And if we pay ourselves more than what we produce than our competitors, the jobs go elsewhere. When we resist change by restrictive practices, while others get ahead, they get the jobs. And you don't build an enterprising economy by imposing high taxation as the other side wishes to do. The message of today's unemployment figures is that we have not yet resolved those three problems. And until we do, we shall not create the jobs we need. If there were easy choices, you can be sure that other nations with governing parties of different political persuasions would be pursuing them. And although unemployment in Britain has more than doubled since 1978, it has also doubled across Europe. And in the Netherlands and Belgium, the rate is higher even than here. Of the major economies, it is Japan and the United States which have done best on unemployment. And it's no coincidence that these are the economies which have an excellent record on unit wage costs, because unit wage costs in Japan have actually fallen by 5% over the past year, while our unit labour costs have risen by 5%. Unless honourable and right honourable gentlemen pay attention to these things, they will not help to get more jobs in this country. Now we're often urged to adopt one particular policy from abroad. But you just can't pick and choose one without leaving others. Those who urge us to follow, those who urge us to follow United States fiscal policy, forget that the size of the deficit is causing great concern in America. In December, Mr. Donald Reagan, the United States Treasury Secretary, said, "Deficit reduction is by far the most serious problem facing the United States, the administration, and the Congress." Reducing the deficit is the number one priority. Now those who urge us, may I finish this section before I do? Those who urge us to follow that particular path forget that in the United States, the state and local authorities run a surplus 
not a deficit as mostly happens in our local authorities. They forget that the United States accepts the discipline of monetary targets and has experienced high real interest rates even higher than our present rates. And they forget that public expenditure takes 10% less of national output than it does here. And what about Germany, France or the Netherlands? They've taken some tough decisions, which I wonder if this House would be prepared to face. Between them, those countries have seen cuts in social services, delays in pension increases, boarding charges for hospital patients, that was socialist France, and cuts in public sector pay. Germany has kept its interest rates half our own despite the rising dollar. One reason is that it's kept its inflation rate at about half hours. And it's no good yearning for the advantages of other countries and ignoring the strict disciplines by which they have been achieved. Now, the opposition motion conveniently ignores all the good things about the performance of the British economy. And it won't want me to say them, so I'm going to. Despite the coal strike and the most determined attempt since the war to inflict damage on the economy by denying power and light to our homes and industries, despite all that, all that which Honourable Right Honourable General Opposite could do, output is at an all-time high. The proportion of people of working age in employment in Britain exceeds that of nearly all other industrial countries and employment is growing. And it does now. Profits have recovered. Profits have recovered dramatically. And in consequence, total investment is at record levels and still growing. And despite the heavy cost of the miners' strike and all that right honourable and honourable gentlemen opposite could do, our current account remained in surplus for the fifth year in a row. In terms of the opposition motion, single out the deficit on manufactured trade. What matters, of course, is not a surplus or deficit on any particular part of our trade, but the overall balance, and that's what they can't get away from. Our oil surplus has enabled us both to import more manufacturers and to invest more overseas, but honourable members opposite are against both. Yet again, they wish to repeal the laws of arithmetic. What would they do to improve the balance in tra of trade in manufacturers? Impose import controls? I can think of nothing more guaranteed to damage efficiency and close export markets. And what of their attitude on overseas investment? Since 1979, Britain's net foreign assets have risen from 13 billion to 70 billion pounds. And these will, provide, these will provide a stream of income to this country for years to come because of the policies of this government. And as domestic, may I finish this point first? And as domestic capital expenditure is at a record high, this has clearly not been at the expense of domestic investment at home. Why then does the Right Honourable Member for Sparkbrook wish to penalise companies who invest abroad in order to earn profits for Britain, or the financial institutions who invest abroad to improve the retirement incomes of millions of pensioners, which they do by that investment? And I'll tell you why. It's because the more wealth he can bring under the power of politicians and bureaucrats, the happier he will be. He wants to invest not where the return is highest, nor where it meets the needs of consumers, but where it furthers the political ambitions of socialism, of socialism which the people reject. Yeah. I can wait the Honourable Gentleman. Before the Right Honourable Lady, before, before the Right Honourable Lady uh, finishes, would, she's given a lot of time and attention to interest rates and money. Would she like to uh, talk a little about the plight of the ordinary people in this country, particularly the unemployed? 
Uh, if the Honourable Member was listening, I pointed out that the only way in which we can increase the number of jobs in this country is by pursuing policies which will increase enterprise other way. Otherwise, the only way is to redistribute what there is, and that in fact would not help to that in fact would not help to further enterprise in this country. Mr Speaker, I was about to come to what the Right Honourable Gentleman scarcely mentioned, the coal strike. Never in this country has a strike been so unjustified. Never has a strike been called by such blatant manipulation of trade union rules. Never has a strike been pursued by such tactics of violence and intimidation. In 1978-79, when the Right Honourable Gentleman for Cardiff South was Prime Minister, democracy and the rule of law were under attack by trade union extremists in the winter of discontent. The Conservative opposition then offered the government whatever th the necessary support to take whatever measures were required. Contrast that with the Labour Party today. Yeah. They actually support political strikes which have totally disregarded democratic values and the rule of law. Yeah. That is not socialism. Yeah. And by encouraging the leadership of the NUM to believe that the government and the National Coal Board could and would concede its impossible demands, the Right Honourable Gentleman and his party have helped to prolong this strike and prolong the suffering it has caused to miners and their families. By their action and prolonging the strike and suffering, they've seen to it that each miner on average has suffered £8,000 in lost wages that the industry has lost 52 coal faces and they've now got a union divided against itself and which half do they support? Not the working miners but those who try to destroy democracy and the rule of law. Throughout this strike, Mr Speaker, when the Right Honourable Gentleman has had a choice between standing up to the leadership of the NUM and keeping silent, he's kept silent. When the leadership of the NUM called a strike without a ballot in defiance of union rules, the Right Honourable Gentleman stayed silent. When the pickets tried by violence to close down the pits of Nottinghamshire and elsewhere against the debt, not yet, I will at the end of this section, when the pickets tried by violence to close down the pits of Nottinghamshire and elsewhere against the democratically expressed wishes of the local miners, the Right Honourable Gentleman stayed silent. When the National Union of Mine Workers tried to impose mob rule at Orgreave, the Right Honourable Gentleman stayed silent. It was only when the General Secretary of the TUC had the courage to tell the leadership of the NUM that its tactics were unacceptable that the Right Honourable Gentleman took on the road. When I come to the end of this section, I will give way. Moreover, the Right Honourable Gentleman knows that the demand made by the leadership of the NUM that no pit shall ever close on economic grounds is an impossible one. He knows that it was never accepted by any previous government, Labour government. He knows that the last two Labour governments have enshrined in their own Acts of Parliament grants to assist in the, and I quote, elimination of uneconomic economic capacity. That's what they put into law when they were in power. He knows that there have been three independent inquiries, the Monopolies and Mergers Commission and two select committees of both houses. Every one of them has endorsed the principle that uneconomic pits should be closed. The Right Honourable Gentleman knows that the offer to the miners is the best since nationalisation. The best pay, I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman in a moment. May I finish this section? May I finish this section? Right Honourable Gentleman knows that the offer to the miners is the best since nationalisation. The best pay, the best investment, the best guarantee against compulsory redundancy, the best early retirement terms and the best color review procedure. But never once has the Right Honourable Gentleman urged the NUM to accept that offer. Never once has he urged them
them to accept the agreement negotiated by NACODS. An agreement on exactly the same terms is available to the NUM. If the Right Honourable Gentleman really wants an end to this strike, as I do, I challenge him to urge the NUM to accept the NACODS agreement. Slow bike swing, slow bike swing. Is the Prime Minister aware? We've heard all that before. But will she... Will she... Would she agree it's without precedent in the field of industrial relations where one side has demanded in writing the terms before the talks begin. Yeah, that's right. Isn't, isn't it a fact that it's her and her government that's assisting on these particular terms and it's a fact that in fact they do not wish a settlement of the minor yeah. strike? Yeah, 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 yeah. The Honourable Gentleman is talking nonsense when he says, yeah. when he says we do not wish a settlement of the minor strike. We do. We never wished it to start. Yeah. Never terms since nationalisation offered by any government were offered by this government. We did not wish it to start. It was started because they refused to observe democratic values. It has been maintained by violence and intimidation. It has had seven rounds of talks which is founded on the same points. Unless the NUM are prepared to discuss the closure of uneconomic pits it, in accordance with the NACODS agreement, Agreement, the next round of talks will founder. I do not wish them to founder. I challenge the right honourable gentleman. Will he urge the NUM to accept the NACOS agreement or won't he? Well, he won't because he daren't. The Right Honourable Gentleman spoke this afternoon, free from both the cares and the serious prospect of office. But nothing underlines the irresponsibility of the Labour Party more than the way it has abandoned in opposition so many of the lessons which reality and circumstances compelled them to learn in government. In office, the Right Honourable General, the Member for Leeds East, said that it was the responsibility of unions not to throw the members of other unions out of work in pursuit of a dispute. The Labour Party and the unions have no such qualms now. The Labour Party and the NUM has no such qualms now. In office, the Labour Party recognised that only put the principle into legislation and implemented closures on economic grounds. In opposition, they pretended never happened. The Right Honourable Gentleman attacks us on monetary policy and calls it a doctrine. There was a Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Leeds East, who boasted that the last Labour government had really given monetary policy the importance it deserves. The party opposite chant cuts. They should know about them. They made the biggest ever cuts on yeah. yeah. The last Labour government cut public spending in real terms on education and science budget, on the industry, energy, trade and employment budget, on transport, on housing in Scotland and in Wales. Now they're in opposition, the Labour Party opposite claim to be guardians of the National Health Service. But in two of its five years in office, the last Labour government actually cut real resources for the National Health Service. Yeah. And over the whole... And over the whole I'll give away in a moment. <laughs> and over the whole period of office, and over the whole period of office, the Labour government cut capital investment in the health service by 35,000%. What is the honourable gentleman to say to that?
what I have to say. Not a laughing matter. What I have to say to that, Mr. Speaker, is there's five million people outside this place who don't find that a laughing matter. Yeah. Yeah. How does the Prime Minister manage to maintain the fiction that at the beginning of the coal strike, her intention was to save £275 million worth of uneconomic capacity? When over the last 11 months, she and her government have spent 20 to 25 times that amount trying to destroy the NUN. If it was about saving money, this strike could have been over within three weeks of its starting. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, year by year, year by year, the amount of subsidy to the coal industry was rising. Last year it was one, the last uh, practicing year, it was 1.3 billion. We were pouring money into new pits. As the three independent reviewers have said, you cannot go on pouring money into the investment in new pits and still retain all the old econ uneconomic. If you do, you, and if you do, you will put up the price of coal and electricity to every other industry and create unemployment that way. That is the answer to the Honourable Gentleman. No, I'm no, no, no more because I'm nearly at an end and I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman wishes to try to catch Mr Speaker's eye. Yeah. The right Honourable Gentleman and the party opposite do not have even the beginnings of an alternative economic strategy. Yeah. That's not just my view. It seems that a Labour Party document somehow found its way to the new statesman. And I hope nobody opposite will in fact complain uh, about that. And this is what that Labour document apparently says. It says Labour has lost the economic argument. Yeah, 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 yeah. It goes on to say the Labour Party has little credibility on policies for dealing with the economy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so say all of us, Mr Speaker. The Right Honourable Gentleman's purpose in tabling this censure motion is not to help the unemployed, he has nothing to offer them, yeah, yeah. nor is it to strengthen the economy, he has no strategy for it, yeah, yeah. nor is it to win confidence, his prescription would destroy it. This censure motion is bogus, yeah. it deserves to be and will be overwhelmingly defeated. Yeah.